Amen. Thank you, Debbie. All right, let's go ahead and open our Bibles this morning to Luke chapter number 23. Luke chapter 23 this morning, as we conclude our seven sayings of Jesus on the cross. And this will be the seventh saying. Luke chapter 23. Let's go ahead and pick it up in verse 44. <clears throat> And it was about the sixth hour, and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Now when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God, saying, Certainly, this was a righteous man. And all the people that came together to that sight, beholding the things which were done, smote their breasts and returned. And all his acquaintances and the women that followed him from Galilee stood afar off, beholding these things. Our Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be here this morning and to hear your word preached. Lord, I do pray that you would speak to our hearts this morning as we open up your word and may your Holy Spirit guide and direct the words to our hearts in the way that you would have them be directed. And Father, if there was one here this morning who doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Savior, I pray especially for that soul that your Holy Spirit would convict them and bring them to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ before it's eternally too late. Now, Lord, we give all this into your hand. We thank you for all you will accomplish. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, these are the Savior's final words. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Woman, behold thy son, behold thy mother. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I thirst. It is finished, and Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. This morning we conclude with the last of the seven sayings. Now Luke records three miracles, the first of which has to do with the Son. Look again at verse 44. And it says, and it was about the sixth hour, and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened. Now the Lord was crucified at nine o'clock in the morning. The supernatural darkness began at noon, and it lasted until three o'clock in the afternoon. So, six hours of dark and dreadful hours, the last three being even darker. For three hours, the, He suffered at the hands of men. And now for the last three hours, he must suffer at the hands of God. Now, it was not the torment of those first three hours that brought blood-like sweat to his brow in Gethsemane. It was the terror of the final three hours. And it was because he that knew no sin was to be made sin for us. That was the agony. The sinless Son of God becoming something so vile and wicked for us that He agonized and sweat drops of blood. And God pulled the blanket of the night over the whole scene so that no prying eyes could gaze upon His agony. Darkness paralyzed the whole land and doubtless terrorized everyone. I mean, imagine that. Imagine being there and seeing that darkness. Don't think of it just like dark at night here. I mean, think about a darkness that can be felt. A darkness so thick that you can't see. Darkness. Supernatural darkness. The second miracle, miracle had to do with the sanctuary. The last part of verse 45 says, And the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. The inner veil of the temple separated by the holy place and the holy of holies itself. 
And no one was allowed to enter into the Holy of Holies except the high priest one day a year on the Day of Atonement. That was to take the blood in there. The only person allowed to go in there. And the veil was made of costly linen, heavily embroidered. It was 60 feet high, and it spanned the temple from wall to wall as thick as a man's hand. And no human could have torn that veil. All right? It was God's almighty hand that tore it from top to bottom to signify the end of Judaism, the end of an age. No more sacrifices were necessary. And the way to the throne was now open for all to come boldly before. Hold your place and look, but look over at Hebrews chapter number 4. Hebrews 4, in verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. <clears throat> now look over chapter 10. Chapter 10. Chapter 10, let's begin at verse 9. Then <clears throat> said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. This is speaking of Jesus, taking away the old and establishing the new. The Old Testament sacrifices, the Old Testament laws, now establishing a new covenant. Verse 10, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standing daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. From henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Wherefore the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which He hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, His flesh. And having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled, from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. We see here the completeness, the power, and internal value of the one sacrifice of Jesus. So complete, so eternal, that it annuls all previous offerings and makes them of no effect. His one sacrifice was so majestic, so excellent, and so infinitely pure, complete and satisfying that it, is, that it is unnecessary and entirely futile for any other sacrifice to be suggested or offered for sin. The sin question is eternally settled in Jesus Christ. Since this has all been accomplished, the results give the believers boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. By the blood of Jesus, the believer is invited to enter boldly within the veil, within the holy place, into the very presence of God. And notice in verse 19, the term Israel is not used. Having therefore brethren, Israel is not used, but, but those who are invited to enter into the holiest are called simply brethren. And brethren means born-again believers. Those who have exercised faith and hope in the Son of God 
accepting his sacrificial atoning death on the cross. And when by faith one embraces his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, that one is invited to come boldly into the very presence of God within the veil. And how different from the Old Testament era, when to enter within the veil meant sudden death. Under the new covenant, it is sure death remained outside the veil. And by what right do we enter into the holiest place? Into the presence of God? We enter by the blood of Jesus. And no one since Adam dared enter into the presence of God without blood. Do you realize that? Adam and Eve were the only people that were in the presence of God with no blood. But since Adam and Eve sinned, now everyone has to have blood to be entered into his presence. Now, we don't enter into his presence literally carrying the blood of Jesus, but in virtue of it having been cleansed, of having been cleansed by it. And since the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ satisfied God completely, we who believe on him have confidence and boldness, absolute faith in our approach to God through the shed blood. Also, verse 20 says, by a new and living way. By a new and living way. The Greek literally reads, by a freshly sacrificed and living way. The way of Judaism was the way of death. The only way people could approach God was through the death of an animal. But Christ is a living way. Listen, He's not dead, amen? He lives. He ever lives. And He is right now on the right hand of God. And since Christ, our eternal sacrifice, died on the cross, the way to God is a new and living way. And there's only one way of salvation. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. He is the way, the only way. Listen, there's no back door to heaven. All right, There's no side door, uh, no detour. All ways except through Jesus are sidetracks of the devil. They're detours of hell. And they do not lead to the pearly white city. And then the third miracle had to do with the soul. The sun, the sanctuary, and then the soul. With the souls, the centurion, and his men. Again, look back at Luke. Look back in Luke. 23 and look at verses 46 and 47. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Now when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. Now if you'll remember, the Lord began his ordeal by addressing God as his Father. Right? That's the first thing he said on the cross was, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. During the hours of darkness, that relationship was suspended. Christ, as a sin bearer, addressed God as Elohim. Now that the ordeal was over, He again addressed God as His Father. His spirit He commended into His Father's care. His body is buried by His, his, body is buried by his friends. His soul went into hell to proclaim his triumph there, and to seize the keys of death and hell. And, and I, did, I forgot to bring that out last week, but that's why when I was talking about the sons of God being angelic beings and Jesus going into the heart of the earth to proclaim victory, he proclaimed victory because those sons of God tried to contaminate, contaminate uh, the human race so that Jesus couldn't be born by demonizing all humanity. But that didn't work. And now Jesus goes to those, those angels that are chained in Tartarsus and he proclaims victory. You tried to stop me from coming, but you lost. 
victory is mine. And little or nothing did these Roman soldiers know of these things. She's got it down, doesn't she? Amen. Yeah. But the one thing they did know, they had seen people crucified many times and they knew the horror of it. But they'd never seen anything like this. This man had prayed for his enemies. He had cared for his mother. He had ignored every insult that his enemies had hurled at him. He had accepted the reverence of a dying thief and comforted him, assuring him of the happiness beyond his bounds of death. He had been clothed in darkness out of which darkness had come a mighty shout. And then he was gone, sovereignly surrendering his spirit to God. And at least one of those soldiers left Calvary a believer. Thoughts full of the one who was mighty to save. Verses 48 and 49 says, And the, all the people that came together to that site, beholding the things which were done, smote their breasts and returned. And all this, and all his acquaintance, and, his, and the women that followed him from Galilee stood afar off, beholding these things. The darkness had silenced and sobered these sightseers. They had come to witness the crucifixion of the Nazarene. They had witnessed instead the convulsion of nature itself. The crowds melted away, and many of those people smote their breast. His closest friends stayed to the end. They stood afar off. And maybe that's why Peter was so readily received back into the fellowship. He had followed afar off, but they had stood afar off. How could they cast a stone at Peter? He had denied him, but they had not confessed him. See, there wasn't any difference between them after all. Now look again at our last saying in verse 46. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having thus said, he gave up the ghost. You know, parents, Christian and non-Christian, they sometimes teach their children certain prayers to use on special occasions. Now, my parents weren't Christians when we were growing up, but they did teach us a couple of prayers when we were children. And one was to be prayed before the meal. And you probably know this one. God is good. God is great. Let us thank Him for our food. Amen. How many know that prayer? Yeah. All right. Another prayer that I think all of us know is that bedtime prayer. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. I guess as kids, we really didn't think about that too much. You know, if I should die before I wake, oh, what a nice thought to go to bed by, right? But we said those prayers. And since the earliest days, faithful Jewish parents have taught their children prayers to repeat at certain times of the day. And many of these prayers come directly from the book of Psalms. Now look over at Psalm 31. Hold your place in Luke, but look over at Psalm 31. This is one such prayer. It's an evening prayer taken from a line out of Psalm 31. In verse 5. Into thine hand I commit my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. As the trusting Jew rests his head on his pillow, that prayer is on his lips, commending himself into God's care during the night's sleep. And you know, I wonder if Mary taught her son, Jesus, this very prayer when he was a young boy growing up. And maybe he said it throughout his childhood and even his teenage years, 
and he could repeat it effortlessly. And so naturally, those familiar words would be on his lips at his final hour of his life. And how appropriate those tender words were. The end had come. He had finished the mission that he had been given. One commentator writes this, The cup of suffering which he had to drink to accomplish his work as Savior had been emptied. The penalty for the sins of the world had been paid. The God-forsakenness had ceased. In his soul there reigned a calm, a sweet calm. He is ready to yield up his spirit, and he knows God will receive it. So his final words are appropriate. Not only because his work was done, but also because death must be given permission. Listen, make no mistake about it. Jesus was not murdered, nor did he die of exhaustion. He did not die involuntarily. He died because he deliberately chose to do so. He picked the time, he picked the hour, and he deliberately chose when he would give up his spirit. He himself had said in John chapter 10, verses 17 and 18, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me. You see that? No man taketh it from me. But I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. He dismissed his spirit. He, the Lord of life, gave up his life. And in so doing, he commits himself to the Father. Calmly, quietly, confidently. In uttering the familiar words of this Jewish prayer from the Psalms, he releases his spirit and he breathes his last. And mercifully, the excruciating pain that he suffered will cease. And death will come as a welcome, invited guest. Now look at how Jesus quoted from the familiar psalm. He said, Father, into thy hand I commend my spirit. But in Psalm 31.5, he added something at the beginning, and he admitted something at the end. Again, Psalm 31.5 says, Into thy hand I commit my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. At the beginning of what Jesus said on the cross, he added the word what? Father. There we go. Father. That doesn't appear in David's psalm. And it really couldn't have. See, in the Old Testament days, people had never yet addressed God as Father. While he was called the Father of the nation as a whole... Such familiarity between man and God was foreign to the ancient Hebrews. But not anymore. This new relationship, which God introduced into, a, into the lives of the faithful, is embodied in the term Father. Father. By adding this prefix to His final utterance, Jesus gave the verse new depth. This verbal intimacy is highlighted by the fact that shortly before he was groaning with enormous pain, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now he uses the term father. No longer. Sin has been born. The desperate loneliness brought on by the Holy God's abandonment is over forever. No more would there ever be a schism in the Trinity. The only time the Trinity had ever been broken was at that moment when God forsook, forsook Jesus while He bore the sins. But that was it. 
No longer will that trinity ever be broken. There will be no more forsaking in the Godhead. He has now turned back toward His Son. And hence, Father is now appropriate. The tender relationship that He has always enjoyed has returned. Sin no longer blocks the path of intimacy. And the other change Jesus made was in the omission of the second half of David's psalm. Again, Psalm 31.5, Into thine hand I commit my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. When Jesus uttered his prayer, he didn't include, Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. And the reason is clear when we remember who is quoting this psalm. Jesus, the spotless lamb, the God-man, the sinless sacrificial substitute had no need to be ransomed. The redeemed need not the redeemer need not be redeemed. He was sinless. He didn't need to be bought back. He didn't his sin didn't need to be, need to be paid for because he had no sin. And so fittingly he omitted the closing line of that prayer to the Father. Now this is a good place to ask. Do you remember another painful dying moment recorded in Scripture when this prayer was used? Stop and think. If you can't remember, turn over to Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. This is the moving account of the first martyr recorded in the New Testament. And his name was Stephen. And after declaring his faith with confidence and courage, he pointed an accusing finger toward the Sanhedrin, whom he called stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, and he charged them with being guilty of receiving the law but not keeping it. And incensed and out of control, they lunged at him, they dragged him out of the city, and they began stoning him. Look at verse 54. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into the heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. And they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he knelt, kneeled down. And he cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. So just before his death, Stephen calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. The martyr's fight for his faith has ended. Though vicious, cruel men with wicked hearts would finish off his life by throwing stones and crushing his skull, his mind was at rest. He would, in a matter of seconds, fall unconscious and shortly thereafter die. But his spirit would immediately be secure in the hands of the Lord and Master. Father, into thy hands, he says. Receive my spirit. Ironically, the one who was standing there looking on in hearty agreement at the stoning was a young man named Saul. And Saul was yet to be remarkably transformed at his own conversion and later to be called Paul the Apostle. Now we can't help but wonder if Paul had Stephen on his mind when years later he wrote of death in 2 Corinthians 5.8. He says, we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body 
and to be present with the Lord. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Peter wrote in 1 Peter 4.19, Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to Him in well-doing as unto a faithful Creator. And so it was with Stephen, the martyr. So it is now with Jesus, the Messiah, who has committed His Spirit into the Father's hands. Now, during his 33 years on earth, Jesus' life has, in a sense, been in the hands of other human beings. I mean, his mother and Joseph held him as a baby and as a boy. And remember, aging Simon took him in his arms and blessed him when he was eight days old. The teachers at the temple might have placed their hands on him as they talked with him, amazed by his understanding and his questions. John, who baptized him, held him close, as did his disciples on many occasions. And as we've seen repeatedly, as we look at his passion, those who put him on trial, scourged, mocked, and crucified him, did so, as Peter later preached, by wicked hands, have crucified and slain. So Jesus was handled many times. Now, at long last, he would be back in the hands of the Father. And interestingly, when Luke records Jesus' final words, the Greek term he uses for commend is the word that means literally to place alongside. And it was commonly used for making a deposit. So the term conveys a secure sense of trust. I entrust my spirit the Father's hands were trustworthy. And what was it that Jesus placed there? No, well, not His body. All right, That would remain on the cross for a little while longer. It would be punctuated by a soldier, or punctured by a soldier's spear, and it would be later taken down, prepared for burial, and placed in a tomb. But it was His Spirit, the innermost, most sacred part of his being that he placed into his father's hands. One commentator describes it this way. In the language of Scripture, it is distinguished even from the soul as the most lofty and exquisite part of the inner man. It is to the rest of our nature that, we fl that the flower is to the plant or what the pearl is to the shell. It is that within us which is specially allied to God in eternity. Jesus knew that he was launching out into eternity and plucking his spirit away from those hostile hands, referring to dynamic, dynamic forces, which were eager to seize it, he placed it in the hands of God. There it was safe. Strong and sure are the hands of the eternal. So the darkness is almost over. The dawn will soon appear. As the tragic scenes surrounding the cross are swallowed up in triumph of his resurrection. Now two realms of application are worthy of at least briefly commenting on. And one has to do with how to die and the other how to live. And first of all, our Lord modeled the art of dying for all of us. Our Lord has modeled the art of dying for all of us. Though mercilessly mistreated, tortured almost to the point of unconsciousness, he refused to retaliate in any way. Though seared by pain from thorns thrust on his head and iron spikes nailed into his hands and feet, he remained emotionally under control. Though cursed and maligned, he never verbally defended himself. And by the time his young life had ended, impaled on that rugged cross, his facial features were so swollen and his body so bruised that he didn't even look human. And in spite of all that, he recalled a childhood prayer learned at his mother's knee 
And he spoke the words of Scripture with confidence and free of bitterness. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And what a model for us to follow as we breathe our last. Listen, regardless of our lot, for sure we have all have our own stories of woe and sorrowful memories of offense and mistreatment. But regardless of all that, this is how to die. Without the bitterness, without the... All the things that could be at that time. And is, is it any wonder that these same last words from our Savior's lips were the ones chosen by Polycarp, Jerome of Prague, Martin Luther, and his friend Philip Melikoth, and many others who had died in the Lord, whose lives were anything but pleasant, and their treatment anything but fair? They died. Martyrs' deaths also, without bitterness but thanking the Lord that they would be with him just as soon as they closed their eyes in death. And then second, our Lord has modeled the secret of living. And we could, where, where could we point to identify any root of bitterness in him? I mean, right up to the last. Listen, there's not a shed of blame there's not a thought of retribution or a hint of revenge. And this is how we should live. You know, just imagine how peaceful our lives would be if we quit holding grudges. Amen? Just think how peaceful our lives would be if we quit holding grudges. If we truly forgave ourselves others who have wronged us. Just think how our lives would be. Because as I've said so many times, an unforgiving heart does not hurt the people that you don't forgive. It hurts you. It eats you up. It destroys you. It destroys your family. Listen, people are going to wrong you. I'm going to wrong you. You're going to wrong me. Because that's life. Maybe not on purpose or on purpose, but you will be wronged. All of us will be. And if we continue to hold grudges, if we continue not to forgive, we will be destroyed. It's plain and simple. We don't get it, though. We just say, well, I can't forgive. Well, then we suffer because we can't. Look what Jesus did. Look how he suffered. Yet he forgave. What was the first words? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. All the beatings they gave him, piercing his hands and feet with spikes, Forgive them? Yet we sit here and think, well, you don't know what they did to me. I can't forgive them. Hmm. Well, I guess we shouldn't live like Jesus. That's how we should live. Jesus did. And he held lines of memorized scripture in his heart and childhood prayers on his lips. The quiet depositing of his spirit into the tender hands of the Father. He deliberately, the deliberate living of his life with single-minded determination to accomplish his mission. And then he releases his spirit. And let me conclude by talking to those of us who say we believe on Jesus and we want to follow him. Follow him, modeling his example. 1 Peter 2.21 says, For here, for even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that 
we should follow in His steps. Let me ask you this morning, directly, are you doing that? Are you following in His steps? Having entrusted your soul to Him at the time of conversion, have you also deposited your spirit with Him as well? Have you come to terms with your past? All the unfair treatment and unkind words. Listen, wherever it takes, go there. Listen, don't stop short of fully forgiving those who don't deserve it, just as Christ did. Just as Christ did. Now again, forgiveness does not mean that what they did is okay. Forgiveness doesn't mean that you allow somebody to continue to destroy you. But forgiveness is of the heart. I'm not going to allow you to do it anymore, but I'm going to forgive you. I'm not going to allow you to destroy things. I'm not going to allow you to do this anymore, but I will forgive you. Just as Christ did. And stay with it until you calmly accept where you are today, all the pain notwithstanding, as Christ did. Remember, he was still hanging on the cross, surrounded by darkness, when he released it all to the Father. And so as his followers, let us do this. The soldier in World War II was fighting his way across the battlefields in France when he stumbled upon an old wooden picture frame. The house in which it was hung was destroyed by fire, and the frame was empty and battered. And wiping away the debris, the soldier saw two Latin words carved into the bottom of the frame, and it's eca or ece, it's E-C-C-E, I don't know how, how to say it, but that's what it says, in homo. And he had no clue what the words meant, but he thought the frame would make a memorable souvenir from his days of battle in France, so he took it with him and later mailed it back to his West Virginia home. And when his mother opened the package and saw the frame, she didn't understand the strange words either but she held it close to her heart and gave thanks for the continued safety of her son. Well, in a few days, she had the mirror fitted in place within a frame, a mirror put, fitted in, in place within the frame, and then hung it in her son's room in their small country home. Meanwhile, the battle raged on in Europe, and the young soldier, mainly out of a growing fear of dying, began attending a simple worship service led by the army chaplain. And eventually he came to Christ and he began to read the New Testament that he'd been issued many months earlier in boot camp. And the more he read, the more he learned of Jesus Christ and the more he longed to model his Savior's life. His heart became increasingly tender and slowly he dealt with the areas of his life that needed attention. Because of his relationship with his new companion, his fears faded. When the war ended, the young man returned to his West Virginia home and was warmly welcomed by, uh, by his family and neighborhood of longtime friends. The first night when he walked up the stairs into his room, he flipped on the light. His eye caught the familiar frame hanging on the wall. His mother had not only put a mirror in it, she had found out the meaning of those two words, and written them on a small piece of paper, which he placed in the corner of the mirror. And referring originally to Christ, the words burned their way into his heart as he saw his own face in the mirror while reading, Behold the man. That's what those two words meant. Behold the man. And tears flowed as he pictured himself in Christ, as he had never pictured himself before. All the way through our journey of the sacred story, it has been the word of God telling us, Behold the man. Behold him at Bethlehem when he was born. Behold him in Nazareth where he grew up. 
Behold him in Galilee as he taught and worked miracles. Behold him beside the table in Jerusalem where he had his last meal with his disciples. Behold him in Gethsemane where he agonized in prayer. Behold him in Golgotha where on the cross he suffered and finally committed himself to his father's hands. Behold the man. And as you do, pause and consider the reflection in the mirror. It's you, but it bears his name in Christ. In Christ. You are in Christ. Christ is in you. Model Christ. Allow Christ to be seen in you. Behold the man as you look in the mirror. Behold Christ. Let me close with this poem. Jesus, refuge of the weary, blessed Redeemer whom we love, fountain in life's desert dreary, Savior from the world above. Oh, how oft thine eyes offended, gaze upon the sinner's fall. Thou didst bear the pain of all. Do we pass that cross unheeding, breathing no repentant vow? Though we see thee wounded bleeding, see thy thorn-encircled brow? Yet thy sinless death has brought us life eternal, peace and rest. Only what thy grace hath taught us calms the sinner's stormy breast. Our Father in heaven, we come before you. We thank you, Lord, for the seven sayings of Jesus on the cross and all that they meant to Jesus and all they mean to us. Father, I do pray that you continue to speak to our hearts and may your Holy Spirit move in us. May we be edified and convicted, uplifted, debased. Father, whichever way you speak to our hearts, may we be moved to change. And I pray this morning that we would not leave here hearers of the word, but doers. And Father, if there's one who doesn't know Christ as Savior, especially speak to that soul and help them to receive Jesus Christ this day before it's eternally too late. And we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I'll stand and join me singing, I have decided, number 10 in your hymnals. I have decided, number 10. We'll give an invitation. If the Lord spoke to your heart and you'd like to come forward, you may do so as we sing. I am decided to follow Jesus. I am decided to follow Jesus. I am decided to follow Jesus no turning back no turning back though none go with me though none go with me still I will follow though none go with me still I will follow though none go with me still I will follow no turning back turning back the world behind me the world behind me the cross before me the world behind me the cross before me the world behind me the cross before me no turning back no turning All right, amen. Well, again, remember, time of fellowship here. Please stay and enjoy some food and fellowship with us. And as we close in prayer, also please remember to ask the blessing upon the food. And as we do, Henry, would you use some prayer, please?